Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy, and eat. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. Please stand as we invite God's presence in our worship. O oh God and Heavenly Father, as we come to worship you, fill us with the power and presence of your Spirit. Give each of us what is needed today. Bless our lives, we ask, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Please join together as we sing hymn number 249, Praise Him, Praise Him.
Good morning, church. So happy to be here today, and I'm happy that you all came to worship with us. I want to direct your attention to the bulletin where we have several announcements, and I just want to briefly highlight a few. Um, today we have a church-wide picnic, so our family picnic, if you want to come, if you want to join us, the address is in the uh, bulletin, and you can be there uh, right after church. It's about 10 minutes to drive from here. Uh, we had a great time, less, less, several picnics that we had, and and we invite you to join us if you can. Um, during the time that we haven't had a, a, an organist, we've had several people that come to church and join us. And we want to especially thank uh, Haesung Park, who has been playing for us since last week. Thank you for being here and being part of our worship today. Um, we send out a newsletter every Friday, and on that newsletter, as well as the bulletin, there is a form and instructions for you to, if you want to request a pastoral visit or a pastoral, uh, uh, one of our pastors to pray with you, please take the time to fill out the, uh, the card that is on the left of this, of this, um, of the bulletin, or you can, there's a form online if you, uh, if you feel comfortable uh, doing that way. Uh, but we encourage you to um, reach out and, uh, you know, get in touch with the pastors. They are here to serve you. They want to pray with you. They want to come and visit you. Um, all you have to do is say, I want to visit, and they'll, they'll make that happen for you. Mr. Wendell Salvador led the early teens classroom for the past few years. He did a tremendous job, uh, but for personal reasons, he um, left the early teens some time ago. And uh, we've been announcing that we have a new teacher. Well, I am the new teacher for the early teen uh, Sabbath school. I've, I've, thank you. I've, uh, I'm very excited about that. I, early teens, the age of 11, 12, 13 is right when I started to work at church and being a part of a church. And I know it's a very important age. Um, where they need to be involved and they need to have activities in the church. And I, I, felt, I felt the need and the call of God to come and work with the teens, and I'm very excited about that. A uh, few of you already know about it, um, but I wanna, just wanted to share a few things with you guys. Our new slogan, our new uh, classroom 
theme is T4C. Um, you saw the signs outside, T4C in the back of the bulletin. What does T4C stands for? You're right. Some of you saw me wearing a black t-shirt uh, a few Sabbaths ago in, in the sanctuary here. That says T4C, and that is Teens for Christ. Um, as part of uh, the program that we have with the kids, every teen have been receiving one of these t-shirts, Teens for Christ, and that's what we are going to emphasize in the youth. And this is the back of the t-shirt. If you want to have one of these t-shirts, just come and talk to me. We can have you, uh, you can, we can arrange that. Um, we want to have the teens of our church focused on Christ. We want to have a Christ-centered program for them that will connect them with each other and with God through Jesus Christ. We're going to during the summer, we're going to have a lot of, lots of activities for the kids, outings. We're going to have uh, programs here on Friday nights, on Saturday nights, get together. If you feel the call and if you feel that God may be calling you to do something, but you don't know what it is, maybe helping with the early teens would be a good idea. Right now, I'm by myself, but I'm open to anybody who wants to help us. We're going to have a lot of fun together. And uh, I, I, if you can't help with that, no worries. You can always help with your prayers. We ask that you please pray for our teens because this is that transition between just before high school where there's a lot of questions and, uh, you know, sometimes they don't feel that they are part of it. Well, we want to make them feel that they are part of our church. And uh, um, we want you to please pray for our teens. And if you don't want to help either praying or helping in the classroom, we can always use your financial support. We have many things that we have planned for the kids. We went through some expenses to uh, change the classroom, which by the way, today after service, I invite you all to come to our teen classroom, the early teens, there's a sign right outside. The door is gonna be open for you to come in and see what we are changing and what we are planning for the kids for this, uh, for this coming year. So thank you so much for um, allowing us to work with you. And again, please come and see me at the end. Um, I need your help, and I can sure use your help. Thank you. Um, I'd like to also take this moment to invite all the children that are up in the balcony back there outside. Come forward at this time. This is the children's story. And uh, while they do that, I invite you all to stand, find someone to share the love, give them a big hug, wish them a happy Sabbath. And if you're a visitor, and with us today, we hope that you feel home and uh, this is your house. Thank you for worshiping with us. Okay, thank you everyone um, for coming down to listen to my story. Are you guys excited to see me? Do you remember me? You remember me, because you're cool. Oh, thank you. You remember me? Oh, that's right. Okay. Well, today I'm going to tell you a story, not about a dog, but about humans this time. Do you think you'll enjoy that? 
Okay, I hope you will. And I'm glad there's so few people today, because if I mess up, it's not that embarrassing, because I did not practice. But I'll try my best, mom and dad. Who here has a friend? Raise your hand if you have a friend. Who's your best friend? Caleb and Colin. Oh, nice. You have two best friends. Who's your best friend? She doesn't want to say. Who else has a best friend? Who's your best friend? Potatoes or mashed potatoes. That's your friend? Cool. What about you? Uh, Viviana. Nice. So she has a human best friend, and I don't know what yours is, but that's great that you have one. Um, what kind of things do you like, guys like to do with your best friend? Anyone? What do you like to do? Eat them. <laughs> Okay, okay. Anybody else like to not eat their best friends? Yes, what do you like to do with your best friend? Play with them, of course. Of course, great. Um, you know, with my best friends, it sounds kind of boring, but I just love to talk. And I can talk and talk for hours and hours and hours with my best friends. Um, so today I'm gonna tell you a story about two best friends. They had really weird names. Their names were Damon and Pythias. Damon, not so weird, but Pythias, a bit of a weird name. So these two best friends, Damon and Pythias, were known throughout the land for how strong their friendship was. They could depend on each other for anything. This story is very old. It happened many, 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 many years ago before any of you were born. Back then, the person that they had in charge of everyone was not a president, wasn't a mayor, it was called a duke, okay? This guy was the duke of Athens, which is a city in Greece. So the duke was not a nice person. Not many people liked the duke. It was believed that Pythias, one of the best friends, was trying to get the Duke out of his position, which is a big no-no in Athens. You can't just plot against the Duke. So guess what happened to Pythias? Because people believed he was trying to get the duke out of his position, Pythias was sentenced to death. Oh, no, we don't want that. We don't want Pythias to die. Isn't that scary? They said, because you were plotting against our ruler, you're going to die. So you know what Pythias said? Pythias said, okay, that's fine. Take me away. But before you do that, please, I have a family back home. I have a mother and I have a sister and they live very, very, very far away across the sea. And I really need to help them before I go. So will you please let me take a boat and cross the sea and settle my affairs with my family. And what did the Duke say? The Duke said, <laughs> yeah, right. Think I'm going to fall for that one? No. I know you're just going to leave, and you're not going to come back and take your punishment like a good citizen. So no, I'm not going to let you take a boat and go home to see your family. Guess what Pythias said? <laughs> no, he didn't say OK. He said, Tell you what, I'm going to let my friend Damon stand in my place. So if I don't come back in three days, you can kill Damon instead. I know, what a tough deal for Damon, right? His best friend just threw him under the bus. I'm just kidding. They planned it from the beginning. Damon loved his friend Pythias so much, he said, it's okay. I will stand in your stead because I trust you. And I believe that you're going to come back because you wouldn't want me to die in your place. 
Isn't that crazy? Crazy. So the Duke said, all right, okay, let's, let's, uh, let's try this out. If your friend is such a good friend like you say he is, he can stand in your place and you can take that boat and you could say goodbye to your mom and to your sister. So Pythias takes the boat and he goes and sails far away to his homeland. So how many days did I say he was given before he could come back? Three. Good. Exactly. Three days. So the Duke turns to his friend who's in his place, remember, Damon? And he says, Damon, I don't think your friend's going to come back. That's just not how this works. Why would he come back when he has a chance to be let go and live his life? And Damon said, what do you think Damon said? Did Damon say, <laughs> you're right, yeah, he's not coming back? What do, what do you think Damon said? He said um, that his friend is going to come back. Ding, 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 ding. Okay. That's exactly what Damon said. Damon said, well, you don't know my friend, Pythias. I know him, and I know he's going to come back. <sighs> this is just send chills down your spine. So two days pass, and the Duke says, ha, ha, your friend's not back yet. Told you so. And Damon said, just wait. He's going to come. I know it. Three days pass. And on the third day, Pythias is not back. What happens on the third day? He's supposed to die, right? So the guards take Damon out to where he's going to be executed. And the Duke says, see, I told you so. No one's going to come back for you because that's not how human beings work. If given a chance to live, they'll live, and they'll let someone else die for them. And Damon said, nope, he made a promise, and he's coming back. So just when they take out the sword to take out Damon, guess who comes back? <gasps> Pythias! That's Pythias. He's over here. He's coming. He's here. He's coming. That's him. I see him. Pythias, and he's running, oh, and he's full of dirt, and his clothes are ragged, and there's blood all over him, and he says, oh, oh, I'm here, I'm here, don't kill him, kill me, and everyone's like, what? He came back, I don't believe it, and the Duke says, what are you doing here? You're not supposed to come back. And Pythias says, okay, so this is what happened. My ship was attacked by pirates, and they threw me into the water, and I had to swim back to shore, make my way back home, settle my affair with my families, and then somehow make my way back. <sighs> but I'm here, so you can take me now. Is that the end of the story? No, that's not the end of the story. The Duke was so impressed and shocked by the strength of Damon and Pythias' friendship, he said, you know what? You can go, both of you. You're let off the hook. I'm not going to pursue this anymore. I want you two to live because I am so inspired and so excited to see two friends who have such a strong bond of friendship, who trust each other so much that I want you guys to live, and I'm not upset anymore. So Damon and Pythias were able to continue living as friends for the rest of their days. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that a great story? Who here has a friend who would do that for them, who would jump a ship? from pirates just to save you. You guys have friends like that? Wow, I don't. I wish I did. Actually, I do. I lied. I have a friend who can do that. Do you know his name? Jesus. Jesus did die for our sins. If you can accept Jesus as your friend in your life, 
things will open up for you. Things will be so much better for you. Life will have so many hardships, but it's easier, it's easier to bear with a friend by your side, right? Jesus can be that friend for you if you accept him into your life and bring all your cares to him because there's no friendship like a friendship with Jesus, right? Okay, you guys look bored. Thank you for listening to my story. Oh, you're not bored? Okay, good. I'm happy. Thank you, everyone. You can go back to your seats. So while the deacons come forward for the offering, um, I'm going to explain that the offering this morning is for uh, Christian Record Services. Um, now, this is an organization. When I read what the offering was going for this morning, I thought that the name sounded familiar, but I wasn't quite sure what it was. So like any good millennial, I pulled out my best friend, my smartphone, and did a quick search, and I discovered that I did know what this ministry was. This is an organization, they've been in existence since 1899, and they provide free reading materials and programs for people who are blind. And these uh, services that they provide, they provide the adult Sabbath school study guides, they provide the children's friend magazines, and they provide our very own Adventist hymnal, all in an audio form or in braille. And uh, I actually have a personal connection with this ministry because when my brother and I were little and we were living in New Jersey, uh, we grew up, there was uh, a family friend of ours who went to church. He was blind and he used these materials. He would teach the Sabbath school lesson, he would lead out in song service, and he was the choir director. And it was all because he used the materials from Christian Record Services. And he still does it to this day, and he's not the only one who benefits from this service. Uh, Christian Record Services helps approximately 20,000 people, I believe, every year by sending out these materials. So at this time, I would like the deacons to please collect our tithes, gifts, and offerings.
you that your word is true and that your promises never fail. Thank you for meeting our needs as we live for you each day. We ask this in your name. Amen. Please be seated. now time for our morning prayer. I'd just like to invite any that wish to come forward to go ahead and do so at this time. And we want to invite all of you to engage in the posture that you feel most comfortable in as we approach the throne of God. So some of you would want to kneel. Some of you would want to come forward. Some would want to stand and bow. would like to invite you to come forward at this time for those of you who wish to so that we can pray.
We come to you this morning, knee bowed and body bent. Oh God, I pray that you would bend our hearts beneath our knees and our knees in some late stage where we could express our humility whereby we come with surrendered hearts and open spirits and receptive minds to your will, your word, and your way. This Sabbath day, O oh God, we just come thanking you from the bottom of our hearts. We thank you for how you've brought us through. We thank you for how you've kept us. We thank you for how you've led us and directed us and protected us. All week long, you've been so good. Oh God, you've been better to us than we've been for to ourselves, and we just want to thank you. Our hearts say thank you. Our lips say thank you. Our songs say thank you. All of us as a church, individually and collectively, we thank you. And not only do we thank you for keeping us, but we just want to magnify you and glorify you for being God. We are excited and we're thankful that you are our God. We have no other God but you. We worship you. We magnify you. We glorify you. And we lift up your name. Because in spite of what the devil does in this world, regardless of what we see going around in the news, we have certainty and confidence, O oh God, that you have not left us alone, that you've got this whole world in your hands. Lord, we trust you. And so today... We just want to acknowledge our brokenness. We acknowledge that we are sinners, that we're sick, that we are messed up, that we have messed up, that we've said things we ought not to have said this past week. We've done things we should not have said. And oh God, today we come as a community of faith with repentant hearts, asking your forgiveness, asking for your cleansing power asking for your redemption, asking that you would cleanse us from the crown of our heads to the soles of our feet. Lord, we seek reconciliation. We want you to make it right because we can't make it right with you unless you make it right with us. So, oh God, today we plead the blood of Jesus. And it is through that blood that we come on the merits of that blood that we approach your throne today claiming the righteousness of Jesus, claiming his goodness, for we have done of our own, claiming, O oh God, that we are nothing without Jesus, but we thank you that with Jesus Christ, we can be everything you want us to be. And Lord, I pray not just for reconciliation between you and us, but reconciliation between us and our neighbor, Every individual, every man, woman, boy, or girl in this church, oh God, today, right now, in some way, shape, or form, we need that reconciliation. And so I just plead the blood of Jesus over every relationship represented in this church, over every family, over every marriage, over every parent-child relationship, every over every brother-sister relationship. Oh God, I plead the blood of Jesus. I still believe, oh God, like we as a congregation still believe that the blood has power. And so we claim that blood over our lives, over our relationships, over our affairs, over our business. Oh God, I pray right now that through your spirit's power, you may transform us through that blood. Today, in a special way, as we celebrate this communion service, we pray for that transformation. We pray in a special way for Pastor Mark, as he shares God's word today with us, oh God, I pray that you will turpentine his imagination, put perpetual motion in his hands and feet. Lord, I pray that you'll pin his ear to the wisdom post, that you would make his word sledgehammers of truth, beating on our stony hearts, that we could come away today convicted and convinced of the power of God in our lives. May we declare surely We've been with Jesus, and it has been good to have been here as we leave this place. I pray these mercies in the precious name of Jesus and for his sake. Amen.
morning, everyone. Your scripture reading this morning can be found in the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 26, verses 26 through 29. Feel free to follow along in the uh, Bibles in the pews in front of you or along on the screens. I'll be reading out of the New King James Version. And as they were eating, Jesus took, ble took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say to you, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on, until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Each quarter, we celebrate communion as a reminder of the great gift of salvation that Jesus Christ has given to us. We do this to keep fresh in our minds the great gift that God has shared with us through the Christ's death on the cross, but even more than that, the offering of his life in order that we can live like he lived. So this morning I ask you to ask yourself this one question. How can this communion serve us? Celebration impact my life. It is important to remember the historical roots that, from which communion came. Communion, or the Lord's Supper, replaced the original meal called the, fast, the Passover. And from the Passover, we get the understanding of God's message to us and his intentions and his plans for our life. We are told in the Gospels that Jesus came to the feast and that he sat down to celebrate the feast of Passover with the disciples. And as they did that, he said, he reminded them why they were celebrating it. You see, the text in Ezekiel 12, 13 tells us that the Passover was named because the angel came and passed over those who had the blood on the doorposts in Egypt. Ezekiel 12, 13 says, Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you, nor destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. So when Jesus sat down to this celebration, there was a very specific ritual in the Jewish economy, the way they celebrated it from beginning to end. But in this particular case, Jesus made a profound declaration. He said, and we find it in our text today, and as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for many for the remission of sin. In this statement, Jesus was saying to his disciples, he was redefining the meaning of Passover. He was asserting a new interpretation, which in effect was saying, I am the Passover lamb. Just as the blood of the original Passover lamb saved the lives of God's people in the old covenant, my blood will save your life. This is a big difference. Those in the early time were protected by the blood on the doorposts and gave them deliverance from slavery in Egypt. But this deliverance 
was deliverance from the penalty of death and the promise of life eternal. This new focus on Jesus' death and on his life so that he would live is what communion is all about. And as we enter into this communion, we realize it's a very serious situation. And in fact, in 1 Corinthians 11, 26, I'm going to be reading from the message. It helps give some focus to what, I'm going to, what I mean to say here. It says that you must solemnly realize is that every time you eat this bread and every time you drink this cup, you reenact in your words and actions the death of the master. You will be drawn back to this meal again and again until the master returns. You must never let familiarity breed contempt. Anyone who eats the bread or drinks the cup of the master inadvertently is like part of the crowd that jeered and spit on him at his death. Is that the kind of remembrance you want to be part of? Examine your motives. Test your heart. Come to this meal in holy awe. So this morning, Paul is telling us that to come to this experience of communion, recognizing the great gift that Jesus made for you personally, that he died to pay for your sin, he, he forgave you, and that he lived to offer you his life so that this gift can change your character to be like him. And what Jesus is asking of us is to accept it by faith and let me change your life. That's what Jesus wants for each one of us. He wants us to not take this lightly, he wants us to recommit our lives completely to him. You see, in this covenant, God is the one who's making the promise. He's promised to, to accept us and to change us. We're not making a promise to prove that we're good enough or that we're going to try harder. But our lives are being changed because of what Jesus is, has done for us and what he will do in us. Philippians 2.13 says, For it is God that works in you to will and to do his good pleasure. And Ephesians 2.10 reaffirms it, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ, Jesus, for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in him. God is offering every one of us restoration. And he's the one who's promising to do the work if we let him do it. I think in a way it's kind of like an illustration of this would be like going in for surgery. Imagine if you had to go in for heart surgery. When you submit yourself to the surgeon, you totally rely on the gifts, the, the skill of the surgeon. Nobody lays there and gives the surgeon's directions on what's going to happen. But somehow in our humanity, we kind of have this problem. We understand that Jesus is the great physician. But from time to time, we, we want to say back to him, oh, 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 don't remove that part. I want to hang on to that. Or, or do I really have to give that up? It's, that's just who I am. But Jesus is wanting to clean out our entire being. And he's offering to do it if we give him that chance. In other words, if we really believe that he's a great physician, that he can come in and he can remake us into his image, he can change our hearts, our minds, and our wills because we trust him and we let him do the job. You see, death came on the human race when we were separated from God. What this experience is all about is reconnecting to God. It's letting God in. It's letting him live in our heart. The Passover focused on the lamb first as a sacrifice to pay the blood sacrifice penalty, as it were.
But the second thing that all those who participated, they took in and they ate the lamb. They were nurtured by it for the journey that was ahead. And so you and I must be nurtured by the life of Christ. He gives us that life, his life, in order that we can live for him. He was, as the Bible said, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. God used the lamb as an illustration of an innocent being taking on the price and giving it its life for another. That illustration holds through to all time. Even the book of Revelation tells us that the lamb is the one who will gain victory. So just as God's people were delivered out of Egypt, you and I, can have Egypt taken from our life, the gods of this world, our own selfishness. God can restore us into his image. God is looking for a people who will give him the chance to clean up our lives completely. And when we come to this table, we are accepting God's provision and plan. He's promised to do the work. We just need to give him that chance. We need to accept his death on the cross and accept his life within us in order that he can, as it were, dwell within us, in order that he can be our life. He has promised to be with us to the end of the earth. He says he will never leave us or forsake us. He has promised to give us his life so that I am in Christ and he is in me and our lives are different. So this morning as you come to the table, accept the invitation of Jesus. He says, come unto me and rest. For we, when we enter into that rest, we cease from our do-it-yourself labors and we begin to live by and to trust his work in us and through us, that we can walk with him throughout our lives. May this time of communion this morning be a great blessing for you as you enter fully into all the gifts that Jesus wants to give you. Forgiveness for your past and strength for the present and direction and hope for the future. May God bless you in that experience. Let's sing together hymn number 412, Cover With His Life.
For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remem remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this, this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, you have created us, you have died for us, Lord, you have redeemed us. And so the words that we heard Pastor Mark speak this morning, let it infuse in our body and help us to accept the power of your resurrection. Help us to accept the power of your blood. Help us to accept the power of your broken body. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
just as bread feeds every cell of a body with life-giving nurturance. So this symbol reminds us that the spiritual life of Jesus is ours as a gift to enable us to do his will and good pleasure. Jesus said, take, eat. This is my body broken for you. We, I'm sorry, we, we have one more thing to take first before we sing that song. In the same manner, he took the cup. And as this life-giving symbol comes to every cell to feed us, his blood gives us life too. We pray and it bless you in Jesus' name. Okay, let's sing that closing hymn. As we exit the sanctuary today, the deacons will be at the door to receive a love offering for the poor. It is this offering each quarter that provides us funds to help those in need. Please share generously. Receive the blessing of the Lord. May the Lord bless you and keep you as we are absent one from another. 
And may the life of Christ dwell in you fully, according to his love and grace, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.